Most Sundays here, as you know, our kids go upstairs for worship and wonder, like they did today. For those of you who haven't heard me talk about this before, Worship and Wonder uses a Montessori-based storytelling method designed to help children experience God while they are learning about God. And it honors the concept that children already have a relationship with God and that we can nurture that through worship and story. So when we tell the Advent stories, we say that we are all on the road to Bethlehem. And there's a little city of Bethlehem, and there is a little felt road. And there are characters that help us find the way to Bethlehem. We say, who will show us the way? And each week, a different character comes to show us the way. So last week, it was the prophet Isaiah who told them that the Messiah would be like a light shining in the darkness. This week, Mary and Joseph are showing them the way up there. And next week, they get the shepherd's story. We have it today. And then the Magi will show them the way on the fourth Sunday of Advent. <clears throat> and these are stories we all know by heart, right? Most of us have heard them from childhood. We may have even acted them out in a Christmas Eve service somewhere along the way. And it can be hard to find something new in a story that you're so familiar with. And that's okay. I mean, hearing these beloved stories gives us comfort. It makes us feel at home. Today's story, as we just heard, is dramatic, with God's heavenly host of angels visiting these lowly shepherds. It engages our imaginations, and it communicates the glory and the majesty of God's peace, message of peace and goodwill to all. One of the best things about worship and wonder is how it encourages children to enter the story or to find their place in the story. So it uses wondering questions to encourage them to imagine how the characters felt. So Pam just gave us a really good example of that. Imagine you're a 12-year-old shepherd. And then what questions would you have? So we'll ask them, after we tell the story, we'll say, well, how do you think the shepherds felt on their way to Bethlehem? Or maybe we'll ask, why did they do things a certain way? Or wonder what might happen next. Sometimes I'll ask them, why do you think this story was chosen to be in the Bible? Why do they want us to hear this story? Sometimes the kids just remain silent as you might imagine. But sometimes they have really profound thoughts. All of the questions are designed to let them know it's okay to question the text. And we hope that eventually this fosters critical thinking about the scriptures as they learn and grow. So one of my favorite um, times in Worship and Wonder, I had like a five or six year old raise his hand and say, did this story really happen? Normally, they're older when they ask those kind of questions. <laughs> and it's great because that's the kind of critical thinking that's possible when we honor the questions and make space for the questions. At the same time, because we don't provide or teach the correct answers, the wondering questions emphasize and preserve the mystery of our sacred stories. These sacred stories are like the familiar stories we tell in our own families, right? Stories that make us laugh and cry, stories that recall holiday tra traditions, they connect us to one another, they make us feel like we belong, like we have a place in the family. They conv convey meaning, and they communicate the values that define who we are as a family. <coughs> so if you were here last week, you may remember in Chris's sermon, he told this story about God starting at creation and then God sending the prophets because people kind of needed some correction. And then he decides, God decides to send Jesus. 
And so they're discussing this up in heaven, and they have, the angels have all kinds of ideas, but God said this new baby that we will send will be just like them. So in similar fashion, if you think about today's story, with this vivid image of the angels bringing their message, God announced Jesus' coming to lowly shepherds on a hillside, not to royalty or political leaders, but to people just like us, ordinary folks. Now, Pam's right. Shepherds are, were actually thought to be pretty low on the social ladder at that point. They didn't make much money. They slept outside near animals or maybe around a fire, so they probably didn't smell very good. And a lot of them, it's thought, were pretty young. It's a pretty unexpected place for God's grand message of peace and goodwill to be revealed. And it's an unlikely group to be entrusted with sharing this news with the world. So the Bible tells us that these ordinary shepherds were filled with fear, which is not hard for us to imagine, right? But then they had a choice to make. So they could have stayed in that place of fear. And they could have looked at each other and said, well, that was crazy, and then just gone to check on the sheep. They could have debated their next steps. They could have drawn lots to see which of them was going to go and check out and see if this story was true. Were they cautious or doubtful? Did they wonder why they'd been chosen? The text doesn't tell us. If they did, they soon moved past that, allowing their enthusiasm to take over. Maybe their youthful exuberance kept them from hesitating too much. And in this case, the story doesn't really need more details. The storyteller has told us everything we need to know. Don't be afraid. Be curious. Hasten to seek out the place that God has called you to. So the shepherds listened. They leaned into their curiosity, accepting the fact that somehow they had been chosen to hear this message. And then they set out together to see this wondrous thing. So how do we enter into this story that we've heard a million times? Like the shepherds, we certainly feel fearful at times. We live with threats of war, climate change, massive deportations. I don't really need to run down the list for you. Like the shepherds, when threats arise, our first response may be fear. On the other hand, depending on our personal situations and identities, that fear may be accompanied by feelings of isolation, or exclusion. We might find ourselves relegated to outsider status. And we may not feel equipped to bring a message of good news to God's people in the midst of these difficult circumstances. But this story also tells us that God shows up in some of the most unexpected places, maybe especially in unexpected places and difficult circumstances. Theologian Marcus Borg talked about the subversive nature of the birth narratives. When these stories were written down decades after Jesus' death, those people had been influenced by Jesus. He had given his followers a different vision, a different expectation of how the world could be. He had invited them to see the world differently than how it had always been. So the birth stories that they eventually wrote down were subversive because they didn't follow the status quo. They were meant to be unique and unexpected, with a stable birthplace and shepherds visiting in the night, reflecting this vision, this new way of seeing the world and seeing how they could live together in it. An upside down, unexpected view of a more loving and peaceful world for all. 
So maybe we enter into the story by identifying with the shepherd's feelings and imitating their actions. Maybe one of our wondering questions should be, what were the shepherds seeking as they made their way to Bethlehem? Or what are we seeking as we journey through Advent? One thing is the shepherds sought to be near this wonderful thing that had happened, to be close enough to be a part of the story. It wasn't enough just to hear the good news. They had to experience it. They had to be in the Holy Family's presence to feel, hear, and see this amazing gift. To be part of God's story, we have to be all in. We have to be present. As followers of Jesus, we know that to love others, we have to stand with them. We have to amplify their voices. We have to walk alongside them in their struggles. We have to be physically near to people. We have to know the people that we say we care about. And we need to know them spiritually and emotionally as well. So when we first established our relationship with Ellie Garal, which is our sister community in El Salvador, it was 1992. And they had just come out of a civil war, and they were repopulating their village because they had all fled into the jungle for their lives. So they are all coming back to their village, and St. Andrew is just getting started up. And so the first few delegations that went down to Ellie Garal they spent most of their time just listening and documenting the stories that the people told. They didn't immediately go down there and start helping to build a building or do those kind of projects. They listened to the stories. Mark Iaconelli, in his book, Between the Listening and the Telling, How Stories Can Save Us, says, sharing stories is how we make a home within ourselves. Story is how we put the broken pieces together. Finding our place in God's story and helping others to do the same is sacred work. So what else? Like the shepherds, we have to be curious and stick together in spite of our fears. We have to seek places to bear witness to God's message of peace as we seek to create places of belonging for all God's people. And we have to remember that we are seeking the same things as all the people that we encounter. It's funny how themes emerge when you start working on an idea. So this storytelling book that I just quoted from as I was reading that, I ran across this story he tells about a, the Buddhist teacher, Pima Chodron. When she encounters people, she quietly within herself says, just like me. The person may be sad or angry, they may be acting with kindness, or they may be behaving very poorly. And she says, just like me. They are just like me. So Mark Iaconelli continues, we are more alike than different. But to realize this, we have to spend time with people, uncovering the stories that reveal our connectedness, especially in times of crisis, when anxiety and fear are ramping up. We need to be together with each other, but also with other people. If we are to build up any trust, if we are to discover new stories, if we are to create a larger, more beautiful vision of the world. The Sufi poet Rumi, seven centuries ago, wrote these words, what you seek is seeking you. So one thing I love about poetry is that like every person in here can have a different interpretation of what that means. Some have interpreted this more like what you seek is already within you. 
which to me sounds a lot like the kingdom of God is within you, or seek and you shall find, knock and the door will be open to you. God is always moving towards us, knowing what's in our hearts, reminding us not to be afraid. What we seek is closer than we realize, if we can just open our hearts and our minds to imagine it. So today we added the candle of peace to our Advent wreath. May our Advent journey bring us peace, the peace that we seek, realizing it is nearer than we have ever allowed ourselves to imagine. Amen.